Good evening. Welcome to Emmanuel Assembly of God. Tonight we're going to continue our Bible study on the book of Genesis. I'm going to be in Genesis chapter 35. So if you want to see the notes, click in the lower left hand corner where it says notes that tab. And then notes will pop up. If you save them you can, as a PDF, you can print them off. So if you want to do that and then come back and, and join us. Genesis 35. Jacob returns to Bethel. Let's get everything you need. Maybe get your glass of water, cup of coffee. Get uh, Maybe you're still eating your supper. And uh, get your Bible, get your notebook, get your lesson. So Jacob returns to Bethel. Now, originally, when they were way back in Haran, God called Jacob to return to Bethel. When he was getting ready to leave Laban, God said, go to, back to Bethel. And you remember how that he didn't go to Bethel. He stopped at Shechem first, and you remember that whole debacle from last week's uh, lesson. So God called him to go to Bethel. Here we go. And uh, here God says to him, build an altar to the Lord. Uh, we can take this as the Lord really calling Jacob to task to seriously start worshiping him and to actually get his house in order, as we will see in this evening's lesson. And he says, reminds him, says, this is the God. I am the Lord that appeared to you when you fled from Esau. Remember that when you were fleeing for your very life. It's been 20 years since that dream of you seeing angels coming down and going back to heaven on a great ladder. Now, the previous chapter did not have to happen if Jacob had gone there first. If we are all honest with ourselves, there are probably things that have happened in our lives that if we had done the right thing the first time, we could have avoided a lot of heartache. That's hopefully something that we have learned and we won't make that mistake again. And the implication here is to really, really start worshiping the Lord. Now, this uh, will begin this, morning, this evening with the cleansing of Jacob's family. Now, we can surmise from last week's lesson where with the revenge of uh, Simeon and Levi, that they were following the ritual of circumcision, but that was an outward sign. Uh, their heart was really not where it should be with the Lord. And so Jacob ordered his family to put away their foreign gods and their earrings. Now, he wasn't saying that it wasn't that he didn't want them to ear, wear earrings. Uh, in this situation, their earrings would have had uh, would have been shaped or done something to remind them uh, of, of uh, idol worship. So just like today, you know how the, uh, we will have a piece of jewelry. It'll have a cross on it or maybe have a little fish on it. And what's that for? Because we like those shapes? No, those symbols are symbols of Christianity and that we are looking towards the Lord, that we're, our thoughts are that way. Uh, and so he's ordering them to put away that stuff. They were to purify themselves, okay, to uh, wash, to change their clothes, almost like what we would think, well, you know, getting ready for church, uh, and then they're going to worship. Clothes symbolize character, okay, if we, if we think about it. Uh, if you look at me when I am dressed to go mow the lawn or to work on the truck, okay, not the clothes that you're going to see me in on Sunday when I come to church. Two different sets of clothes there. And uh, so he's telling them to purify themselves and to change the clothes. And again, okay, remember how the earrings would have had symbols of their foreign, of foreign gods? Uh, their clothes also could have been either the colors or the design or maybe even embroidered with symbols of uh, foreign gods. And so he's, you know, making a change. Now, his family got right with God only after 
Jacob did. And this is important for us to realize that we will lead our families. And so lead your family, do what's right, and there's a big chance that your family will do that which is right. Now, again, remember that Rachel had stolen her father's idols. And so there's kind of an indication here that uh, their family, uh, these families with all of the different uh, mothers and all the different children, that they were still uh, hanging on to their uh, foreign idols. Question number three, God's protection of Jacob. This is in verses 5 through 7 in Genesis chapter 35. Now, it would have been fair for God to leave Jacob at the mercy of uh, the Canaanites, all right? It, uh, you know, what the, his boys did it was, was terrible, and it certainly was excessive for what happened and what they did. The, 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 the punishment did not meet the, the crime. And uh, it was just horrible. Uh, now, the Canaanites, the other neighboring cities, uh, they may have looked to take vengeance on uh, Jacob and his family. Uh, and so God's grace covered Jacob even when his sin uh, made them vulnerable. And when I say his sin, he, he wasn't involved in that, but it was his sons that was involved in that. Uh, and so, you know, we're looking at it today, centuries, thousands of years removed from it. And uh, so the cities around, when they heard what Simeon and Levi, Levi did, in our uh, economy today, we might think, oh, well, they're going to attack, and that was a possibility. However, we need to put it back, look back in that time that uh, the other uh, city-states, they would have heard uh, that uh, Hamer's son Shechem took advantage of Dinah and that her brothers avenged uh, their, his uh, advances. And so they probably may have, besides God protecting, uh, they, they probably, okay, we get it. We all have sisters. If someone did that to one of our sisters, we probably would have done the same thing. But God's grace covered Jacob here. And so at this point, we see that he did indeed build an altar, and he called upon the name of the Lord. And we don't mean that he just went to church on Sunday and prayed. Uh, this is a lifestyle that is really happening. Uh, now, he might have justified disobedience at this time because of fear and not done what God asked and told him to do. However, he is trusting the Lord more all the time. You know, the closer we get to the Lord, the more that we trust him. Now, question number four, right in the middle of today's uh, study of Genesis chapter 35, right in the middle of that, we have a, a verse that, that has no context. It has nothing to do with the previous verses. It has nothing to do with the next verses that are going to happen. And, and, and we read nothing else. This is the only place in Scripture that we even read about this. However, if we read between the lines and we understand this, this is just a wonderful, a, a, a wonderful uh, insertion of something that was going on in the background that we are given uh, a little window to. We read of the death of Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, in verse number eight. Now that would have been the nurse to Jacob's uh, mother, Rebecca was his mother, and now this doesn't mean that uh, Rebecca, Rebecca's nurse died right at this moment. It's the only account we have of her. Uh, we can surmise that she came with Rebecca when she married Isaac. So when Eliezer went to her of the Chaldees and brought her, brought Rebecca down to Isaac, that Deborah, her nurse, came with her. 
and she was a beloved member of their family. Okay, just highly regarded, and they loved her. Um, we don't know when she died. Uh, we it, it doesn't mean that she died at this point in history that we're looking at. At some point in time, uh, she has passed away. But the important thing is that she was buried under the terebinth uh, tree, uh, a tree of religious uh, respect. Uh, the place was called Alon Bakuth, which means uh, oak of weeping, that they were uh, sad at the passing of Deborah. And so uh, this verse is inserted here, and it's very well possible that they had come past this point and that uh, Jacob may have been recounting to his children how that this was uh, his mother's nurse and uh, all of the wonderful stories that and the memories that Jacob would have had of, of her. Uh, just like we do today of someone, maybe a favorite aunt or maybe they weren't an aunt. Uh, maybe they someone that took care of us when we were younger and you know, maybe we go to visit where our uh, family is buried and we look over there and, and there is someone that was precious to us at that time. And, and so we just, in the middle of this sort of chaotic time, in the middle of this fearful time that Jacob has, we have this wonderful family, little insert of the love of family and those that take care of us. Now in verse number nine, we have God appearing to Jacob. Uh, God blessed him. Uh, in, when it's talking about the God blessed him, this would have been the interaction. This would have been God blessing him, God uh, pronouncing a blessing over him, that God, he calls him by his new name. You will notice that in the last couple chapters, when we have talking, been talking about Jacob, we have not been referring to him as uh, Israel, his new name. You know, remember when he wrestled with the Lord all night long and the Lord touched his uh, thigh and his hip went on a joint and he walked differently after that. God, the Lord told him, you will no longer be called Jacob, but you're going to be called Israel because you have wrestled with God and you have prevailed. Now, uh, and we have on purpose, we have not been calling him by his new name, because you remember in the last couple, three chapters, Jacob has been acting like old Jacob. All right. He, he's been acting in his, his old ways. Uh, so we know that he repented. We do know that he went to Bethel and he got rid of the idols. Uh, that he, he may have suspected that they were there, but up to this point, he hadn't uh, purged the camp. So he did his first works of building an altar and seeing God. Now, this is important for us to understand. When we do the things that we should be doing, when we worship the Lord, when we are praying, when we are reading God's word, when we're taking what we read and we apply it in our lives and we do the right thing, that's first works. And so that's what we need to be doing. And when he did that, God repeated his promises about the land to Jacob that God was going to give him as he promised to Jacob's uh, father and Jacob's grandfather, to Isaac and to Abraham. God was going to keep his word and give that to Jacob and his descendants. Now, Jacob poured out a drink offering to the Lord. Now, a drink offering was, now this was wine that was poured out in sacrifice before the Lord at the altar. In other words, instead of them drinking that, they would give it symbolically to the Lord. And so he poured out this wine on the altar in symbolism of giving it, it was a sacrifice. He didn't partake of it, he gave it to the Lord. We do know that in the New Testament, Paul considered pouring out his life a drink offering to the Lord. So those are things that are precious in our sight when we surrender them to the Lord. This is a reflection 
of Jacob's gratitude toward God. Now, we should never have the attitude, I was robbed. Jacob has suffered some hard times, but in all reality, when we look at the bottom line of Jacob's life, he was truly blessed, and that God's hand has been on him mightily for the last 20-some years. We learn in today's uh, chapter, chapter 20, uh, chapter 35, we learn of the birth of another son to Jacob, and that's in verses 16 and 17. We learn that Jacob's wife, Rachel, remember that Jacob's wife, Rachel, was his first love, and you remember how that his father-in-law, Laban, switched wives, and he was married to Leah first, and then to Rachel, and you remember that Leah had lots of children, had children very easily, and Rachel, she didn't, she only had one son up to this point, she only had one child up to this point. Well, in this second child, she has a very difficult labor, she is struggling. Now, we don't read of any of the contentiousness of before. Uh, you remember the, the, the competition between Leah and Rachel and between their nurses, uh, between their uh, handmaids was fierce. Uh, and we don't read of that anymore. Now, it may be uh, because they are all older now, okay? When we get older, you know, <laughs> sometimes we become a little more mellow. Or now that they were in the promised land, it, it maybe they were realizing, you know, having all these children wasn't quite so important as they thought it was to be. And, you know, it's possible that uh, Leah and the others, when they saw Rachel, uh, not being able to have children, it may be now that they were having a little compassion on her. And, you know, and when she was having uh, a difficult labor through her pregnancy, maybe they were cutting her some slack. In other words, they're all getting older. Another thing too, remember we just said in the previous verses, they now are focusing on worshiping the Lord. So if you think about that, how do you treat people? When you're, when you're not really focusing on following the Lord, or maybe you weren't following the Lord, you might have treated people unkindly. But now that you've come to the Lord, you treat them differently. And so as they're worshiping the Lord, you know, they're, it's a change of heart. And it should be a change of heart. In our chapter today, the sad thing is that we see that Rachel, question number eight, Rachel died giving birth to this son. Now she named her son ben Oni, meaning son of my sorrow. And if you think back on her pregnancy and how she was struggling and giving birth, uh, she was in such sorrow. This shows the futility of her competition with Leah. Uh, now, at the time of her final victory, because she has produced a son, all she found was sorrow. You know, sometimes we, sometimes we are in competition with others around us, and you know, sometimes the only competition really is in my mind. It's not in theirs. I put myself, I set myself up in competition with them. And after it's all said and done, what is it? Now, can you imagine having your name meaning son of sorrow for your whole life? And so Jacob changed the boy's name to Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. This implies uh, son of right hand. It implies strength and it implies honor. See, he's the last son that Rachel would have. The first son was Joseph and the last son was Benjamin. And so this implies strength that would come from Ra uh, Rachel 
and honor that came from Rachel. Now question number nine, they were on their way to Bethlehem when Rachel died. Uh, Jacob set a pillar over her grave in honor. It was a tragic fulfillment of the curse Jacob pronounced on the uh, thief of Laban's idols. Remember that? And so here this sadness reminds us that we, when we return after making mistakes, there are, there are painful consequences that you know, we are forgiven, but there are things that are still going to happen in our lives. Now, the sadness isn't over in this chapter. In verses 21 and 22, we read of the sad conduct of Reuben. We may have, uh, and again, we don't know exactly when this happened, but this is when it's recorded. As Just as the verses earlier about uh, Deborah, uh, Rachel's, Rebecca's nurse, uh, we don't know when that happened, but it's inserted there. And so here we have this story here, the sad conduct of Reuben. He slept with his father's concubine, uh, Billa, and uh, that was not something he should have done. Uh, he dishonored his father. Now, being the firstborn, we expected better behavior from him. Uh, we also might have expected the birthright to fall to him as he was uh, the first one of uh, Leah's children, uh, but now we see the birthright will fall onto the fourth son, Judah, because you remember that you have uh, Reuben, the oldest, and Simeon, and then Levi, and what they did last week was uh, abominable, and so they disqualified themselves for the birthright, and now it falls to Judah. Verse number 27, and, and this chapter just has so many different chapters, <laughs> you know, here we're, we're grouping them together, but it is, uh, uh, so it was just a, a, a terrible, terrible time, uh, and it was a time of all these things that have nothing to do with each other. Uh, Jacob was afraid he was going to die, or Isaac, I'm sorry, Isaac was raised going to die at least 20 years before that. Remember when he called, uh, he called Esau to him and said, go get me some game and I'll bless you. That was 20 years ago. We read now uh, Isaac dies. Now we read nothing dramatic of their time together. Now it's possible that they've had brief visits over the last years. We don't know how many years that Jacob was back in the land before he actually went to see his father for the first time. He may have visited many times. We're not aware of that, but this is the, the funeral. This is the, the time of uh, Isaac's death. Question 11, 12, Jacob and Esau buried their father together. And you know that Esau had been reconciled to Jacob and Jacob reconciled to Esau before this. And we've had that uh, chapter. It must have pleased Isaac to have that feud settled before he died. He also must have been excited to see Jacob's family. Imagine that. Uh, Isaac had two boys, Jacob and Esau, and that was it. But imagine his pleasure when he uh, finally got to meet Jacob's family. I mean, Jacob, you know, he has 13 children, okay? That must have been exciting for them to come to visit. Imagine, imagine holidays around, around their household. Well, that's our lesson this evening. Thank you for being with us. I trust that something has been said here this evening that will encourage you and lift you up. And let's close in prayer. Father, we are grateful that you are always with us. We pray, Lord, that your blessing tonight would rest upon your people. We are aware, Lord, of some people that are not feeling well this evening. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would raise them up from beds of affliction. We also know, Lord, of some people that are going through some hard times tonight. So, Lord, we pray that you encourage them and lift them up. And Lord, set their feet on the solid rock. Be with your people tonight, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.